are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. In the summer of 1940, a desperate battle raged in the skies of England. If Britain lost, Hitler would invade. At the heart of the fight was one remarkable squadron. Brave, rebellious, unconventional. 303 Squadron shot down twice as many Germans and boasted one of the Battle of Britain's greatest aces. The pilots kept a record of their exploits in a unique diary. But it isn't written in English. Allied fighter, Polish pilot! 303 Squadron was made up of Poles who came here to fight for freedom and help change the course of British history. How in hell do you think you're going to fight the Germans if you can't even fly the ruddy aeroplane? My men did not come all this way to sit around learning English. Using the accounts of the squadron aces and the testimony of the pilots who knew them, this is the untold story of the Battle of Britain. Only the English Channel and a few hundred RAF pilots stood between Britain and invasion. Now Adolf Hitler stood just as Napoleon had stood more than a hundred years before. As Britain prepared to fight to the death, thousands of Polish servicemen came here, the last free country in Europe. We knew that England would continue fighting, you see, and, and uh, uh, we could sort of join them. They'd fled their homeland and crossed Europe. Now the Poles had only one desire, to fight the Germans. Our country was defeated. We wanted it back. The commitment was total. The Poles were eager to fight. Britain was short of pilots. Hello, boys! They didn't think we, we really have any stomach for, for fight anymore. That, that we are a spent force, and that we are an embarrassment and a burden. Out of all the Poles, only two of them have any English at all. Kent's commanding officer was Ronald Kellett. It was his job to turn 303 into a fighting force. The men are being taught basic operational vocabulary. All I know about the Polish Air Force is that they lasted three days against the Luftwaffe. Well, let's hope we can make them shine more brightly operating from England. Time was running out. Germany's high command wanted to complete the invasion of Britain before the winter set in. In early August, the Luftwaffe intensified its mission to destroy Britain's defenses. The Germans had two and a half thousand aircraft. The RAF, just over 600. The pilots knew full well what Nazi invasion meant. In Poland, the wholesale destruction of a people was underway. Schools and colleges had been shut, teachers and doctors shot, and the first prisoners had arrived at a slave labor camp called Auschwitz. Since leaving Poland, Miroslav Ferec had made it his duty to keep a record of events in what became the squadron diary. We are surprised that Adolf isn't taking advantage of this beautiful weather. You'd think he'd be bombing so hard you could hear echoes across the island. But it hasn't started. It was Ferec, you see, that, was, that kept the diary. And he would invite other pilots to make a contribution. Well, I was never invited to that, you see. I was too, too small of a little minnow, you see, it, <laughs> among the aces. <laughs> What's going on? Maybe it's a lack of personnel. <laughs> He's planning something.
agonizing day-long wait, at 5.50, the Poles were finally scrambled for action. Fighter Command radar detected 200 German aircraft crossing the channel. Red leader, red leader! Man, that's no The 303 was about to be tested in battle for the first time. Take the targets and go get them. Ferrich had fought the Germans in Poland in outdated aircraft. Now he experienced his first dogfight with the enemy in a modern British fighter. I caught up with him easily. He grew my sights until his fuselage fit the whole luminous circle. It was certainly time to fire. I did so quite calmly and was not even excited, rather puzzled and surprised to find that it was so easy. Quite different from Poland, where you had to scrape and strain until you were in a sweat. And then instead of getting the bastard, he got you. These Polish, uh, they loathe the Germans. All we were interested in was to destroy airplanes. Whereas the Poles, they wanted to kill anybody that was in these airplanes. In less than 15 minutes of furious vengeance, each of the six pilots of Kellett's flight had shot down a Messerschmitt. Witold Urbanovich recorded a spectacular first day in the squadron diary. 303 Squadron has opened its account with a vengeance. The Poles had joined the battle just in time. Hitler's planned invasion was thought to be only weeks away. Repeat again, please, Goddard. Captain John Kent, a skeptical Canadian chaperone, was with 303 over the south coast on the second day in action. Realize we are only six. I repeat, Kent's only flight of six planes faced 150 enemy aircraft. Kent described how the Poles dealt with such overwhelming odds in his autobiography. Sergeant Rogowski, who was doing search formation behind, pulled up and went head on into the middle of them, closely followed by Franchek. The German formation split up and a general melee ensued. Kent watched amazed as the Poles flew head on at the enemy bombers. With a closing speed of over 600 miles an hour, the slightest error would be fatal. Streams of grey trace of smoke crisscrossed the sky in all directions. It was impossible to hold a steady aim. And snap shooting was the order of the day. In the frenzied dogfight, a Messerschmitt repeatedly latched onto Kent. But each time it closed in for the kill, it was chased off by a Polish pilot. Kent was certain of one thing. The Poles hadn't learned to fly like this in England. Back at Northolt, Sergeant. Kent did his best to express his gratitude. Thanks. For keeping that hun off my tail. The hun. Off my tail. Okay. Not one, Mr. Schmidt. Six. But not all of 303 had returned to base. In defiance of orders, Joseph Frantischek and another pilot were harrying Germans all the way back to France. Frantischek had a habit of departing from the squadron and hunting on its own, which was perhaps against the discipline but at the same time, because of his individual expeditions, his victory is mounted. Frantischek, a Czech pilot who had joined the Poles when his own country surrendered, was well on his way to becoming one of Britain's highest scoring aces. The 
Group commander appreciates the offensive spirit that carried two Polish pilots over the French coast in pursuit of the enemy today. This practice is not economical or so sound now that there is such good shooting within sight of London. I'm killing Germans. Many excellent pilots have died due to lack of discipline. Do you want to become one of them? I fly alone. In a unique compromise, it was agreed. From now on, Frantischek could leave formation to hunt alone. In just six days fighting, 303 shot down 24 enemy aircraft without the loss of a single pilot. We were one fighting family. Together we dreamed of a brighter tomorrow, when after the war, we would return to our motherland. As the battle entered a bloody new phase, the Poles would be at the heart of the defense of Britain. In this historic battle, the mightiest air force after the British is the Polish Air Force. Every day we are winning against the Germans. In just one week, the Poles of 303 had overturned British prejudice and proved their fighting spirit. On the afternoon of September the 7th, they shot down 16 enemy aircraft in less than 15 minutes. It was a record unbeaten by any other RAF squadron. Gentlemen, be vigilant and careful to preserve your lives. Poland will need you at the end of this war. As he flew over the capital, 303's Canadian Captain John Kent witnessed the aftermath of the first day of the Blitz. I could see the fires that the Luftwaffe had started on this, the first raid on London. I had not realized that I could feel so deeply. But at that moment, I would have butchered any German I could lay my hands on. I was beginning to understand the attitude of the Poles. They're very much like us. We found that, uh, apart from the language and uh, national differences, that uh, we thought and they thought more or less on the same lines, which was uh, kill the Hun. But not everyone believed a handful of ill-disciplined Poles could be shooting down so many Germans. Chief skeptic was their own group captain, Stanley Vincent. Treat these claims with a lot of reserve. Sir? I want you to go through them with a fine tooth comb. Yes, sir. But Vincent didn't wait for the intelligence officer's report. When the Poles took off on the 11th of September, Vincent went on his very own spying mission. He followed the 303 going into action, and he kept his distance and wanted to see how, how they do. He wanted to find out for himself. He didn't have to wait long. Bandits, three o'clock. A veteran of the First World War, Vincent had never seen flying like this. The Poles had jumped in on the scattered individuals and suddenly the air was full of burning aircraft, parachutes and pieces of disintegrating wings. It was also rapid, it was staggering. The British trained pilots to fire from around 400 yards. The more experienced Poles were able to fly to within 100 yards before they opened fire. The effect was devastating. I think anybody who was keen, and they were, and some of us were keener than others, was the closer you got in, the better. A bomber aeroplane is quite a, a large uh, target when you get that close. Every time Vincent tried to get a German in his sights, a Paul dived in front of him and shot down his target. 
Vincent was transformed from skeptic to believer. I told Wilkins that what they claimed they did indeed get. Any luck, sir? My God, they're doing it. Sir? On the 15th September, the Luftwaffe launched what it intended to be a final knockout blow to destroy London and Britain's morale. This day would decide the fate of Britain and stretch every pilot to breaking point. A 400 strong enemy armada crossed the channel. At 11.15, the poles were scrambled and thrown into battle. I had shot down a donier, then had to hide in the clouds with a bunch of Messerschmitts in hot pursuit. Even for experienced pilots like Zumbach, the stress of two weeks' combat had taken its toll. For the first time in my life, I was really afraid. The fear makes everybody cautious. Uh, so the degree of fear is a good thing. The, the important thing is to overcome the fear. And naturally, longer you fly, that process of initial fear, of overcoming the fear, wears you out. Everybody was afraid at one time or another. You don't know what the hell is going to happen, where are you going, and, and how the other side will react. Seconds seem to pass like minutes. You live in a kaleidoscope of rage and icy detachment, continually alternating fits of attack and escape, now freezing, now sweating. Then, suddenly you emerge with a shock of surprise into a peaceful sky, as if you died and been reborn into another world. You block out if you're in a turn. It's dangerous, because it's the time when you're blocking out, you can't see, you don't know who is behind you. myself together and managed to knock out one of the chasing Messerschmitts before running for cover. I had to fade into a flat cloud bank, keeping an eye on my surroundings through gaps in the clouds. In the first epic battle of the day, 303 helped stop the German bombers reaching their targets and claimed 10 kills. But the squadron joker, Zumbach, was to run out of luck. Messerschmitt especially used to come in, dive, and out. You know, in the air, when you're there, it's all in seconds. Oh, I've been hit several times, but I've been down twice, only twice. And each time, I got away, <laughs> you see. Bound to be France, I told myself. You're as good as in prison. I carefully fold my parachute, feeling pleased with myself for having kept hold of the ripcord. The sign of a cool head. Some men appear, and fire each time I make the slightest move. They all come to a halt. Except for one man who approaches with a peculiar weaving walk. He's pissed, I think. So, I took out my pistol held it at arm's length, and threw it away. Then I see his uniform. It's British. At the top of my voice, I yell out, Allied fighter! Polish pilot! Sorry I fired! I, I didn't aim at you! Then why did you fire? I threw my gun away! To stop you moving! You're standing in the middle of a minefield! Zumbach was out of the fight. But the biggest day of the Battle of Britain was only halfway through. On the afternoon of the 15th of September, a second wave of German bombers pressed home their attack. As the battle neared its climax, every available aircraft was scrambled to fight for the survival of Britain. 
Up to 10 o'clock, 175 German aircraft have been destroyed in today's raids over this country. The Poles had only nine aircraft left. At 2.25, they were scrambled to help repel a 300-strong enemy force. Between 350 and 400 enemy aircraft were launched in two attacks against London and Southeast England. About half of them were shot down. Only seven aircraft made it back to Northolt. Five were so badly shot up, Kellett said they were fit only for scrap. Today was the most costly for the German Air Force for nearly a month. Against immeasurable odds, the RAF held its own. The losses were so high that Luftwaffe High Command realized that they won't be able to achieve air supremacy. His plan to break Britain from the air had failed. Two days later, Hitler postponed the invasion. That same day, Joseph Frantischek, who hunted alone, became the first 303 pilot to receive a British medal for bravery. This pilot has taken part in practically every operational flight carried out by this squadron. He has shown great gallantry in always attacking vastly superior numbers of enemy aircraft. With 17 confirmed kills, Frantischek became the highest scoring Allied ace in the Battle of Britain. He was killed less than a month later. 303 Squadron had shot down twice as many Germans as the leading British unit, for a third of the losses. On the 26th of September, King George VI made the first of many visits to congratulate the Poles. He was so proud, he so said we knew that means something, Poland, he said. Ludwig Paskiewicz, the pilot who broke formation to make 303's first kill, had been shot down. He was only the fifth pilot of 303 to die. Jan Zumbach commemorated him in the squadron diary. He was one of our best friends. A brilliant pilot, in love with his role. He gave his life to flying, and flying took his life. He did not die of natural causes or in an accident. He died in battle, having achieved what he'd always dreamed of, victory. The war had more than four years to run. But by October 1940, the Battle of Britain was over. Most historians agree that the Battle of Britain was won by a narrow margin. And it could be argued that perhaps this narrow margin was uh, supplied by the 303 Squadron. It is with genuine regret and sorrow that I terminate my association with the finest squadron the RAF has ever seen. Captain John Kentofsky left 303 to lead his own squadron. My profound thanks for keeping me alive and teaching me how to fight. Oh, never mind the flannel. In the book. Miroslav Ferich was killed on patrol in 1942. His precious diary was continued in his memory. By the end of the war, the 303 Squadron Diary filled seven volumes. None of the 303 aces who fought in the Battle of Britain are alive today. Every year, a dwindling band of veterans gather at the Polish Memorial at Northolt to honor the fallen and keep their stories alive. This is my highest decoration, Virtuti Militari. It's one of the highest Polish decoration for bravery. And here, defense medal, defense of the 
country is Britain, uh, you see. 1,973 Polish airmen lost their lives in the Second World War. But in spite of their sacrifice, Poland would be denied its freedom when the war ended. In February 1945, with victory in sight, the Allied leaders met at Yalta. Britain, which had gone to war to defend Poland, now faced the growing power of the Soviet Union. Yalta was complete reversal of the British stand and it was terrible shock for the Polish forces which fought so valiantly. To pacify Stalin, at the end of the war, the Allies handed control of Poland to the communists. The dream of freedom the Poles had fought and died for was over. The Western Allies won their war. Everybody won except us. We lost. In June 1946, Britain held a spectacular Allied victory parade. Czechs, Chinese and Iranians all marched down the Mall past King George VI. But not a single Pole. My father was on the sidelines as, as the parade was going down the Mall. Not only given no credit for it, but, but basically being uh, denied existence. It broke his heart. Plain and simple, it broke his heart. Not one of the 200,000 Poles who fought fascism marched with the Allies that day. Britain did not invite them for fear of offending Stalin. We felt that the Allies really betrayed us. We were absolutely shattered. We were in despair, really, what to do. What about you, Benevitz? Will you go back to Poland? The papers are saying you should go home, rebuild your country. There's no work for you here now. No. You know what brought us to France and to here. You have won the war, but we have lost it. Witold Urbanovich did later return to Poland. Accused of spying, he had to flee to America. Other pilots were not so lucky. A lot of my friends did go back, and some of them, or a lot of them actually, uh, made a sticky end. Unless you were a communist, you said, there was no future for you. At the end of the war, we were really not wanted in this country anymore. There is so many of us, and uh, we are competing for the jobs. People didn't really mind where we go, didn't, didn't particularly uh, press, press us to go here, or they just get out of the country, leave, go back to Poland, or go anywhere you like. I think we've never been really welcome by English, really welcome. That's for sure. Rather, some may be polite and so, because we know all the English politeness, but, uh, but not as a real welcome to this country, Polish people. I don't know why not. 